We're so proud of you. There's been some great comments. I don't, have you read the article? If you guys haven't read it, it's by, it's by Patty, Miss Patty Powers. And it's gone out in the tropical aisles and gone all over by email about what you guys have done with, uh, with helping your community, with the um, Adventist Community Services, by getting the money and then getting all that food and taking out. So I know most people have their cameras off, but actually I think most everybody now. But if you put a thumbs up, would did anybody help with that? Any of you, any of you guys want a thumbs up? Anybody thumbs up help with that? I see some names in there. Easy, yeah, Maverick, your family. Was that fun? Was it a good blessing? I bet it was, wasn't it? Because it sounds like the people were really appreciative. And I, I really liked your answer to when they asked and said, um, so I'm, you know, can I either give you money and what was the other one? One person said, I'm sorry, I can't come to your church or something. And you guys said, no. And they said, well, why here, right here, why as they were overwhelmed with gratitude. And one response was because God loves you. It was no strings attached. We're here to serve your, your community. So thank you all. Thank you, Agate. You guys have led the way, um, with this and it's really, really neat. And it actually has to do what, what you did has in a way to do with the sermon today. Because the sermon today is on the fourth beatitude. And the fourth beatitude is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so this we're, today we're gonna talk about being hungry and thirsty. And I will try to finish before everybody is too hungry and thirsty today but I'm just excited to see you all. I'm glad to have so many kids too, because I've got some stories in here I think the kids will enjoy. But let's pray together as we, as we open God's word. God, thank you for the Agate Church. Thank you for how you have used them to be a blessing, Lord, during this really difficult time. Um, I know that as they have shared this food in the community and it's, it's filling people's physical hunger Lord, I know that there's just as many houses with people who have a spiritual hunger. And I just thank you, Lord, that as they were out to minister, that they were able to connect and pray with those who, who need you, Lord. And I just ask that as we're in this, um, as, we, as we talk about a parable today, but as we're in this beatitude, Lord, that you will give us uh, exactly what we need from these words of yours that will help us to grow to love you and to see your compassion and, and the deep love that you have for your people. Thank you in Jesus name, amen. So there's one disadvantage of growing up in countries and in places where there's lots of food and lots of drink because when Jesus would use a statement like this, it's hard sometimes for us to be able to connect because when he was sitting there on the mountain and all these people were gathered around him and Jesus said those words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. He was talking to a group of people who knew what it was like to be really hungry and really thirsty. Because that part of Israel and that part of Palestine, you know, they only got 26 inches of rain every year. And that's the difference between Guam. You know how much rain Guam gets a year? 80 to 110 inches and i think this year we've already gotten our 110 plus right so they they only got 26 inches that's not very much it was a very arid dry place it was very difficult to grow anything and those people knew what it was like to be hungry they knew what it was like to be thirsty have any of you ever experienced what it's like to be really hungry or really thirsty i bet there are some of you who have and, and, you know, when, when you grow up sometimes in places where there's just food all around, it makes it difficult. But sometimes I think, you know, what if, what if some of us who knew what it was really hungry and thirsty, if we were sitting on that mountain that day, how we would have understood Jesus's words differently. And so I found this story. One of them was by somebody who, who at one point, all they were thinking about was food. And this was, this is a little history lesson here. This is from Sir Ernest Shackleton. Anybody know who Sir Ernest Shackleton was? He is the, he is the famous Irish, actually was something I learned as I was studying his story. He was an Irish uh, Antarctic 
explore. And he, he took three British expeditions to try to get down to the South Pole first and all this kind of stuff. But there was a story, and I want to read you part of the story because it says, in the Antarctic summer of 1908 and 1909, Sir Ernest Shackleton and three companions attempted to travel to the South Pole from their winter quarters. They set off with four ponies to help carry the load. Weeks later, their ponies were dead, their rations were all but gone, they, and they turned back towards their base and their goal was not accomplished. Altogether, they trekked for 127 days. So on the return journey, as Shackleton records in his book, The Heart of the Antarctic, the time was spent, on the whole way back, the time was spent talking about food. They would describe, he and his companions would describe to each other elaborate feasts and gourmet delights, sumptuous menus as they staggered along, suffering from dysentery, not knowing whether they would survive. Every waking hour Shackleton records was occupied with thoughts of eating. So I know I ask you this question, I ask it again. Have any of you ever been that? hungry. I, I have to be honest and say, I never have. Yes, I used to come in to my mom. I can remember coming to my mom and she's like, what's wrong? I'd be like, I'm starving. And I remember my mom saying, Ken, please don't use that word. Because it was true. All right. I ate four hours earlier, but I was starving. That was, that's, that's not the definition of the word starving. There are a lot of people in the world today who are very, very hungry. I, I haven't experienced it personally, but you know, some of my favorite books to read are survival books. They're books by people who float in the ocean for you know three months and how they make it every day and so forth. So, you know, in some of those books, it's so detailed. Sometimes I feel like I've experienced exactly what, what they've experienced. Um, but I know that as Jesus was saying those words, that the people were connecting and he was saying, blessed are those of you who hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. All right, we're going to get to righteousness in a moment. But what does it mean, do you think, to be really, really thirsty? It's a little different being hungry. You can go how long without eating? Come on, you scientist, nurse type of people. I see your mouth's moving. I can't hear you, of course, but... What you, you, you can go, what, 20 days, 30 days? You go, can you go a month? But you can't go very long without drinking, right? And as I was doing some research, I found another story, very interesting. This was, this was a story that was written by E.M. Blakelock. He was a famous Christian writer in the middle of the 1900s. And he had interviewed a guy who was part of World War I with a group of uh, New Zealanders and Australians and British who were fighting in World War I. And, and, and the guy was talking about a time when they were really, really thirsty. This is what Blakelock wrote. He said, and he's quoting now, he's quoting this guy, um, Vivian Gilbert, Major Vivian Gilbert. And he's, he's describing uh, Gilbert's story. Here's what Gilbert said. Driving up from Beersheba, we were a combined force of British, Australian, and New Zealanders and we were pressing on the rear of the Turkish retreat over very arid desert. Our attack outdistanced our water carrying camel train. Water bottles were empty. The sun blazed pitilessly out of the sky where the vultures were wheeling expectantly. Our heads ached, shared Gilbert. Our eyes became bloodshot and dim in the blinding glare. Our tongues began to swell. Our lips turned a purplish black and then burst open. Gilbert went on to share that those who dropped out of the column were never seen again, but the desperate force battled on to Sharia because there were wells at Sharia. And had they not been able to, to take Sharia by nightfall, thousands of them were doomed to die of thirst. Gilbert says, we fought that day as men fight for their lives. And we entered Sharia station on the heels of the retreating Turks. The first objects which met our view were the great stone cisterns that were full of cold, clear drinking water. In the still night air, the sound of water running into the tanks could be distinctly heard and it was maddening in its nearness. 
Yet not a man murmured when orders were given for the battalions to fall in, too deep facing the cisterns. Orders, orders were given on who went first. First, the wounded, those on guard duty, then company by company. It took four hours before the last man had his drink of water. And in all that time, they had been standing 20 feet from a low stone wall on the other side of which were thousands of gallons of water. I believe, Major Gilbert concludes, that we all learned our first real Bible lesson on that march from Beersheba to Sharia Wells. And then Blakelock, as he's finishing this article, Blakelock reflected on Gilbert's comments and Blakelock said, if such were our thirst for God, for righteousness, for his will in our life, a consuming, all-embracing, preoccupying desire, how rich in the fruits of the Spirit would we be. So is it possible for us to thirst for God in such a way? Is this possible? I think it is. Because, you know, as you go through the Bible, you, these little texts pop out like, like texts by David, where, where David says, as the deer pants for the water brooks, right? So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, David said, for the living God. And then another place, David said, O God, you are my God. Early in the morning, I will seek you. For my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So church members, I ask you, are you thirsty today? Do you really, really want to drink? I don't have this as part of my notes, but um, yesterday I was with someone who we went... Um, went out to, to do a little work on, on their property. And this was up in the Santa Rita area. And uh, we met a gentleman when we were finished talking. And uh, he, he had been there the whole time, but we, we got to talk more after it was all finished. And, and I felt very sad because the gentleman was describing um, to the other man and I who were there uh, on the property, he was describing how he was going to have to sell his house soon. And he said, I, I have to sell my house because I, um, I've gotten a divorce recently and I don't need a four bed, three bedroom house. And when he said that to me, it was like the whole rest of the conversation for the next 30 or 40 minutes. I just, when I looked in this guy's eyes, I could just tell he was so heavy, like he, he was so burdened and it made me feel so sad. But what made me feel more sad was at the end of it when we were just getting back in the car and he was walking away and I just felt impressed. I felt impressed and I turned and I said, hey, and he turned around. And I said, you know what? I'm a pastor. I said, if you ever need anything spiritual, hit me up. I said, I'm here to help you. And for a moment, it's like, look, and then he, he kind of dropped his head and he turned and he says, no, I'm okay. And then he kept walking. And I got back in the car feeling sad because I thought, here is someone who they are thirsty. They are hungry. They deep inside, that is what they're really looking for, but they don't even know. They don't even know what, what drives. They know they need something more. And they're, and they're carrying the weight of all of this divorce and whatever is going on in his life. He's having to carry it himself, not knowing that there is someone who would fill that hunger and that thirst. And it reminded me of Jesus who, who in scripture, not only when he was sitting on the mountain and he's talking to the people there, but in the Old Testament, we find that he was constantly through the prophets. God was constantly telling people. He was making it very clear for anyone who would read the words. And some of those words are found in Isaiah chapter 55. And, you know, Isaiah 55 is actually a chapter that Ellen White tells us that it's one of the chapters in the Bible that we should memorize. It, that, that's how powerful it is, she says. And at the very beginning of Isaiah 55, we hear God calling to all these people who are divorced or going through these heavy burdens or, or are looking for, um, to fill their hunger and thirst in other places. And he says, Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2, Ho, listen, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without bread 
And then he asks the question, God asks us the question, why are you spending money for that which is not bread? And why are you spending your wages for that which really doesn't satisfy you? If you listen carefully to me, God says, and you eat what is good, your soul will delight itself in abundance. The invitation of God for us to come, and then as we eat, and we are filled with thir uh, for our hunger and our thirst. And then we turn to, even if it's asking people, and even if they reject us, it's, it's him wanting to, us to take some of the food that we've eaten and some of the drink that we have and give it to people around. At least offer it to people, even if they say no. God knows that all around us are people who are hungry and thirsty. And that's exactly how it was when he walked the earth. That's why many times he brought up these illustrations about being hungry or thirsty. One of my favorite is in John 6, when he turns to the crowd and he said to them, look, I am, you guys know this text, I am the bread of life. He said, he who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. And, and you can see every single time people came to him, and when they listened, they went away full. That's exactly how it happened with the woman at the well. Uh, John chapter 4, the woman comes to him, and they have this whole dialogue together. And I love how Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of the water, of this water in Jacob's well, they're going to thirst again. But whoever drinks the, of the water that I will give him, they're never going to thirst again. But the water that I give him, this is something we often forget, the water Jesus said that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That means it pours over to those around you. And that's exactly what happened through you guys in Agate. You, you when you took out this food to the neighborhood, that is that living water springing up to everybody that's around your church. So this last month has been an emphasis, and right now our, our Sabbath school lesson is an emphasis on what? Adventist education. And this is not a sermon on Adventist education. I just, I have to take a side road here, though, just for a moment. Because the whole quarterly based on education is to help open our minds. And I know, you know, for many church members, um, sometimes it's difficult when we think, you know, well, What's the big deal? You know, if I send my kid, if they learn English or if they learn math or if they learn it in a public school or they, they learn it in an Adventist school, what's the big difference? Can I tell you what the big difference is? Because our Adventist system, and I say this as the son of a principal and a teacher. My mom was an English teacher. My dad was a principal my whole life, you know, except the very end where my dad went into college education. But I, I grew up in an education household. I know from my own parents that the very foundation of Adventist education is to create a hunger and thirsting in the hearts of young people to come to Jesus and find what they're looking for everywhere else. Does that make sense? And so the teachers, when they're in class, their job is not just to teach English, it's not just to teach math, it's to help young people learn to love Jesus, to learn to be passionate about him, learn to be a spring of living water themselves. And I know I'm talking to a bunch of you who, who went to Adventist schools when you were growing up, at least some of the time, and you know the foundation that that gave you um, in, in helping to help people now to, to find um, spiritual food and spiritual water. It is very important that as we listen to these words of Jesus and understand the context of this one beatitude, that we stop for a moment to ask ourselves the question, are we really hungering and thirsting for God? Sometimes it's really easy to lose that, that initial hunger and thirst. And many of you remember what that initial hunger and thirsting is like when you first got to know God and Revelation calls it that first love. And then, and then over time, sometimes it can just become mechanical. where We go to church, we do the same things. And that hunger and thirsting starts to, either it starts to quiet in our hearts, or we find that we're starting to turn to other things to, to try to fill that spot that we feel hungry and thirsty, that we're kind of distancing ourselves from God. And I think that's why when Jesus said, he was very specific. He's like, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? For righteousness. What? 
kind of sounds nebulous, doesn't it? So I'm going to try to break down as best I can. I know we've got a lot of young people too, so I'm going to try my best to make this make sense to you, uh, to everybody. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? So in doing a Bible study on righteousness, I found that basically righteousness is two things. This isn't too hard to understand, but here it is. Uh, Let me just read you the definition. One of the Bible commentaries just put it in, in two sentences. And they said, righteousness is both being right in God's eyes and doing right in God's eyes. It is a state of being and a state of action. Can I read that again? Righteousness is being right in God's eyes and doing right in God's eyes. It is a state of being and a state of action. This is very important because a lot of Christians only take one side of this. We think that righteousness is somehow only a state of doing. Like it's it, everything about like, Everything has to be focused on doing right, and we don't recognize there's a very important step that's before that, and and that is making sure that our hearts are right with God and that we are in a state of being righteous with Him. And and so I won't get into the whole technical term. Scholars call it imparted righteousness and imputed righteousness. There's kind of these high terms they use. But But I basically want to narrow it down with this. So in this, 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 Imputed righteousness is the one that's given to us, all right? That's something you can't earn. That's the state of being righteous in God's eyes. It's what I call, and I think this will make sense, it's what I call the gold for garbage plan, all right? Uh, So you give God your sins, and he gives you righteousness in exchange, It's called gold for garbage. And so to try to make it easier, I actually wrote this little story and parable about it. So here it goes. The man stopped and stared at his friend coming towards him on the other side of the street. He whistled to get his attention. The man came over. So what's got you skipping down the sidewalk this morning? Well, you won't believe it if I tell you. Well, come on over here and try me. Okay, listen. I got gold for garbage. Gold for garbage? Yeah, you didn't see the king's decree? You bring him garbage, and he will give you gold. Look for yourself. It's on this announcement that's been going around. Let me see that, the man says, yanking it out of his hands. The king hereby announces his exchange program of gold for garbage? Bring your garbage, and he will give you gold? This is ridiculous. No, it's true. I took him my garbage. And look, look, he gave me gold. You know what? Actually, that's not, that can't be real gold. You're a little cuckoo. No one gives gold for garbage. Well, if you take him your garbage, you'll see for yourself. And then you will know why I'm skipping down the sidewalk this morning. Bye. So we're going to finish the story in a moment. But this is what the Bible says. It talks, Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about gold for garbage. He calls it righteousness for rubbish. So you want to look up the text with me? You got your Bibles? He calls it righteousness for rubbish. It's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And I could pop it up on the screen, but I'm just going to read it to you. But but it's Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 9. This This is amazing because... God talks about to us about what it means to be righteous. And the way that you get righteous in God's eyes is to take him your rubbish, your garbage. Philippians 3, 8 and 9, Paul says, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and have counted them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So I skipped a little passage. Let me go back up here because Paul in another place, when he's writing to the Roman believers, he says, he goes through talking about how how Abraham believed God, 
And God accounted that to Abraham for righteousness because he had this faith in him. But then as Paul is explaining this, and this is in Romans chapter 4, as he's explaining this to the Roman church, he puts this other sentence in there that's the gold for garbage, the righteousness for rubbish sentence. And he quotes actually David in the Old Testament, and he says this. He said, in the middle of this, in, in Romans chapter 4, Paul says, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. That means trying to work and get God's favor. All right, and then he quotes this from David. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. That's giving God your sins and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin, meaning give him righteousness. So that's the whole gold for garbage. Take God your sins. The very first important part of being a hungry and thirsty for righteousness is making sure that every single day, did you hear me? How many days a week? How many days? Every single day that you clean your slate with God. All of us are broken people. All of us say things we wish we heard, wouldn't have said. All of us do things that we recognize later that was wrong. Or we're in the middle of something and we hurt somebody or we do something and God brings it to our mind. Every single day when his convicting spirit lays that on you, guess what you do? You take your garbage and you give it to him and you ask forgiveness. Guess what he gives you in return? His righteousness. It makes no sense. But it truly is gold for garbage. And when you take that gold and you allow it to, you allow it to, uh, when, you, when you appreciate that gold in the way that you should, it starts to do something inside of you. And this is the part about doing righteousness. So you make yourself right with God every day by giving him your sins. And then scholars say something begins to happen inside of you that they call the imparted righteousness. That means that God begins to work through you and that well begins to spring up and spread over and righteousness begins to flow out of your life. And, and so the imparted righteousness is something that has grown in us. The first kind of righteousness is given. The second part is grown in us. And what does that look like? Let's continue our story. Knock, knock, knock. Hey friend, good to see you again. What can I do for you today? Well, someone told me that you had done, you had done something really crazy with that gold that you got for garbage the other day. You know, you show me that gold on the street. They told me to come to your house and to see for myself what you did with your gold. Well, did you get yours? The man said, leaning out the door. No, I didn't go get mine. I don't really have that much garbage. The man leaning out the door says, well, the last time I was at your house, you had garbage stacked all over the place. Pew, stinky garbage. Well, I've never seen any garbage around my house. Oh, never mind. So what did you do with your gold? I, you probably buried it, I suppose. Nope, I didn't bury it. I don't really like telling people what I did with my gold, but if you really wanna know, I'll show you. Dear wife, can you call the children? What? What? My one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Kids, you had you had all these kids. You hate kids. You've always told me you hated kids. Well, not anymore. And these aren't my kids. Well, kind of they are. Well, not really. They're orphans. I okay. I use the gold to open an orphanage. An orphanage. Yep. And it's the funnest thing I've ever done. You should try it. No, I hate kids. Well, if you were to take your stacks of garbage in for gold, you'll be surprised at how you will love the things you used to hate, and you will hate the things you used to love. I have a wheelbarrow out back you can borrow to haul your garbage in if you want, except I think you might need a dump truck. Big smile. Once you get your gold for garbage, you can't bury it. If you bury it, then the righteousness that you receive from God is no good. 
Righteousness has to be put into action. And it's not even you, it's him doing it through, through you. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to, you have to be willing to say, I surrender, even if you feel your heart going other ways, for God to take that righteousness and start to use it in you, to start to grow it in you. And it will grow if you put it into action. I really like the way Ellen White puts this. She's talking about this whole thing in Christ Object Lessons. And she says this, she says, quote, righteousness is right doing, and it is by their deeds that all will be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. The works show whether the faith is genuine. It is not enough for us to believe that Jesus is not an imposter and that the religion of the Bible is no cunningly devised fable. We may believe that the name of Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby man can be saved, and yet we may not, through faith, make him our personal savior. It's not enough to believe the theory of truth. It is not enough to make a profession of faith in Christ and just have our names registered on the church roll. Hereby, she quotes 1 John, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is the genuine evidence of conversion. Then she finishes, whatever our profession, it amounts to nothing unless Christ is revealed in works of righteousness. And I've already mentioned that none of this righteousness is anything we generate, whether we get it free from him as a gift or whether it is something that is grown and generated through us. How do I know that? Because it, there's a really neat just little text that jumped out at me one time and I underlined it back and forth in my Bible. And it's Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17. And it's actually the verse right before God calls and says, everyone who thirsts, come to me. Remember that was Isaiah 55? It's the, it's the verse right before it. And this is what it says in Isaiah 54, verse 17. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is their gift, God says, that their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Every part of righteousness comes from him. But righteousness has a competitor. It has a competitor. And that competitor is called sinful pleasure. The pursuit of sinful pleasure, the hunger and the thirsting for pleasure, not only can separate us from God, but the devil can even use it to separate you from life itself. How do we know this? It's a well-known history, and this is for many of you more mature generation today. You know this, you know this because you were, some of you were alive at this time. It's a well-known history that Elvis Presley followed after not only just material things, but after sensuality of all kind. In his prime time, Elvis Presley made $5 million a year, which back then, was an incredible amount of money. In his first two years of stardom, he brought in $100 million, $50 million a year, his first two years. It is said of him that he had three jets, two Cadillacs, a Rolls Royce, a Lincoln Continental, a Buick, and a Chrysler station wagon, a Jeep, a dune buggy, a converted bus, and three motorbikes. His most favorite car was the famous 1960 Cadillac limousine model. The top of it was veneered and covered in pearl, literal pearl, white veneer. The body all around it was sprayed with 40 coats of specially prepared paint that included within that paint crushed diamonds and fish scales. Nearly all the metal trimmings around the car were plated in 18 karat gold. Inside the car, and I know we won't think this is a big deal today, but this is back then. Inside the car, there were two gold-covered telephones. Whoa, I mean, I mean I, I, but that was a big thing back then, right? Two gold-covered telephones, a gold vanity case containing a gold electric razor, gold hair clippers, electric shoe buffer, a gold-plated television, a record player, an amplifier, an air conditioning, and a refrigerator that was capable of making ice in two minutes. Elvis Presley had everything. Or did he? How did Elvis Presley die? He committed suicide.
This is from the SDA Bible Commentary. Listen, quote, only those who long for righteousness with the eager anxiety of a man starving for lack of food or famishing for want of water will find it. No earthly source can satisfy the hunger and thirst of the soul, whether it be material riches, profound philosophies, the satisfaction of physical appetites, or honor and power, end quote. So do you want righteousness? Do you want it? Can I give you just a little tiny secret of how to get it? It's not hard. And this is from the book Mount of Blessings, where Ellen White gives us in one sentence, the secret of how to get righteousness. She says, quote, it's not by painful struggles or wearisome toil. It's not by gift or sacrifice. It is not through any of those things that righteousness is obtained, but it is freely given. It is freely given. Here we go. Sorry, one more time. It is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. That's why Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And it's neat because that word filled means to be fully and completely satisfied. I know that in any group, doesn't matter if it's a church group or I know that any size of group, there are those that even come to church who many times we haven't really come. And my appeal to you as the Agate Church is, I don't know. I don't know who. I don't, I don't know who's listening and your cameras are off and whatever. I don't know where you are with God in this. But if you really want righteousness, all you have to do is ask for it. All you have to do is come. That's what Isaiah 55 says. The invitation that was given then, the invitation that was given Jesus on the mountain, the invitation today still stands. It's for us. It's for our children. It's what will cause me for a man to be walking away to be able to say, hey, hey, if you ever need anything spiritual, come and talk to me. To be able to get to the point that we are willing to ask people around us. We're willing to do whatever because we want people to experience the same joy and the same fullness that we have, that we found when we've hungered and thirsted for God. It's his invitation that still stands today. It's an invitation that goes all through the Old Testament, and we know that it's important because God closes his book, the Holy Bible. He finishes the Bible with two appeals, and you know these, you've heard these, but he finishes the Bible by calling to anybody and everybody to come. He said it in Revelation 21, and then in the last chapter, Revelation 22, he says this in Revelation 21, verse 6. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, Jesus said. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely, freely to him who thirsts. And then right at the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 17, he said, the spirit and the bride say... Come on, Bible students. They say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, Jesus said, let him take the water of life freely. And that's my prayer for you today. And, and I'm not going to make you open your cameras or give any verbal testimony today. It can be behind the quietness. It can be wherever you are and whatever is going on. But I would ask you at this moment, as I'm praying, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for anyone who's listening today. I want to pray that, that out of a desire that God has already placed in your heart, if it's there to want him and to move away from those things that you're trying to fill in your life because you're hungry and you're thirsty, but you don't even know maybe what it's for, and you want his righteousness, and you are, you are claiming his promise to freely accept his righteousness. I just want you to close your eyes. Bow your head, Lord Jesus. It is our desire, Lord, to be in a sanctuary right now where we are sitting next to each other and we are face to face. 
but you know we cannot be. And it is through this Zoom room, Lord, that we gather today to worship you. It's, it, it's your sanctuary today. And Lord, I want to pray for, for anyone that's listening to this message. God, I want to ask that for those that you have already placed that hunger and that thirsting in their heart, or if you have stirred that hunger and thirsting, even as we've uh, been together today, Jesus, that, it, that, that anyone that lifts up their hand right now and asks for that, for that righteousness that you will freely give, Lord, that you will fill them right now with your, with your Holy Spirit and with the, with the spirit of peace, Lord, and that you will, I claim the promise for them, that you will fill them, that they will be fully full of this righteousness that you have promised. Lord, we also commit ourselves as a church family. We commit ourselves to give you our, our garbage, Lord. We claim the promise that you will give us this gold of righteousness. And Lord, we also accept that you will grow this in us. And I ask that you will do this in each of us, Lord. We are, we are not to where we need to be. We all know that, Lord. But we place ourselves before you today that you will continue to do this work in us and bring it to full completion as you have promised in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. So we give ourselves to you now in the name of Jesus. Amen.